بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على أشرف الأنبياء وسيد المرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين Greetings of peace I want to welcome everyone to this virtual gathering and we have the great honor and the great pleasure of discussing uh, Allah and the ones beloved to Allah the awliya, the awliya, the saints and sages of Islam and uh, I want to welcome everyone tuning in from all around the world on behalf of Wasit, as well as the Center for Global Muslim Life. And uh, we are joined uh, today by our dear brother, our teacher, our elder on the path, Peter Sanders. And we have the distinct honor of discussing uh, his new book, which is 50 years in the making, which is entitled Meetings with Mountains, and is a book that uh, showcases Peter's uh, meetings with spiritual giants, spiritual mountains for the last five decades all across the world, all across the globe, from the deserts of the Sahara to the jungles of Nusantara, Southeast Asia, and even the northern lands of England itself. Um, I've had the blessing of actually seeing a presentation of this even before it was out. And uh, I have had the blessing as well for many years of knowing um, Peter Sanders. And, you know, they say about an artist that an artist's art is their soul made visible. And so we get to uh, look into his soul and if that is the case, then uh, we are joined by a very beautiful soul. And because I've also known him, I know that there is something about the way that he sees the world that allowed him to see um, what, what he has seen and to, to capture what he has captured. And so the beauty of this book and this whole project is we get to see through his eyes these great men and women of God. And one of the most beautiful things uh, about this is that, and I won't read the official bio, I'm just speaking from my heart and my, my own relationship with, with Peter Sanders, is that he's not just a, a world-renowned and acclaimed photographer, but he is a true seeker on the path. And I really do not believe that this book, I know for sure this book could not have been made by someone who just was a gifted photographer, but it could only have come from someone whose heart was primarily seeking the creator and those who were near to the creator. So uh, with that, I want to welcome you, uh, Peter, and we're honored to have you with us. Thank you so much. Thank you for the invitation to uh, share this journey and story with you. Um, it's so been, inshallah, what loved. we'll do, what we'll do for those that are tuning in is, uh, CD Peter, I'll allow, I'll give you the time and then I'll hand it over to you in just a moment and allow you okay. to present because not everyone has the book, not everyone has seen it yet. And so uh, these pictures are worth many thousands of words. So we'll let you present a little bit about it and, and just share and discuss the project and the individuals in it. And then after the presentation, we can come back together and engage in a yeah. bit of a discussion uh, to explore it a bit further, inshallah. Fantastic. So shall I begin? Yeah, bismillah. You can begin now, inshallah. There it is on the screen. Uh, I don't know what time it is there in America, but anyway, I'm greeting you from uh, from uh, England in Buckinghamshire. And this project changed my life. And when I began this project, uh, 50 years ago, I had no idea what it would grow into, but it uh, it was really just following my own journey. And 
I'll begin and then we'll just explore some of the people from that project. This is the cover for the, for the book and the title came from Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. Uh, and as soon as he said it, Meetings of Mountains, I knew that was the title for this book and uh, the picture uh, grew out of that title really and I will explain the person in this picture uh, as we go through the book. The book I dedicated to the next generation of peacemakers which is all of you people viewing now, it's really you know us older people we're coming at the end of our time but you know you're going to inherit this mess there is but then it's in your hands to really bring about the peace that we have not reached yet and it's really uh, we have to be those people we can't talk about it we have to become those people uh, one of the prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam's constant prayer was oh allah i ask you for your love and the love who of whoever loves you and the love of deeds that will bring me closer to your love. There's an ayat in Quran which says, Bismillah, have not we made the earth an expanse with the mountains as pegs? And this analogy of mountains with these peak people becomes more obvious as you begin to understand them and their role in the world as we experience it. Uh, the book begins with, of course, uh, the Prophet Muhammad and entitled his section, The Chosen One Who Climbed the Mountain to Enter the Cave of His Own Heart, was in the cave of Jebel Anur that he withdrew from people, withdrew from society so that he may know his Lord. And I think really, I realized as I was doing the book that he's really the blueprint for these people, the saints and sages. And it's, why it's quite important for me that he was at the beginning of the book, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is uh, Jebel Noor, the mountain of light where he withdrew from people and I've climbed up there uh, various times. I've climbed up there with my family and I sat in the cave and it, it, you know, it was not an easy climb. It's, the last part of it is quite dangerous. Those of you who have been, you know that. Um, it, the last bit is a little bit steep but uh, it, it's beautiful up there. And this is the view from that cave uh, at sunset time. And from that, from that cave, he could overlook the mountains and hills of Mecca. Um, this is the cloak that was given to uh, Awaisul Kharani. And maybe many of you know the story, but for those who don't, Yuesu uh, Karani came to Medina to meet the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was traveling at that time and he waited but his, his mother was sick at the time and he didn't want to leave her too long so after a few days he left. But when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam arrived back in Medina he said to his companions, there has been someone here, who was he? He just had this sense. And they mentioned Uwais al-Kharani. And the Prophet took his cloak off and he gave it to them and he said, take it to, find him and take it to him. Now often this, among these people, when someone like that, or even a great saint or sage gives you something, it, there's a symbolic meaning in it and a lot of it's to do with protection and things like that. 
Um, this cloak has always been in the possession of the family of Yue Sukharani ever since that time. And um, in 1981, I went to Turkey. In those days, the cloak was kept in a very small wooden box with a glass door. And during Ramadan, they would put it on show and people would line up in a long queue to see it. And I joined that queue with a couple of friends. We were visiting Turkey. And when we got to the 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 robe, the cloak, when the, the guard who was looking after it knew we were English, he opened up the door of the cloak and I got this incredible perfume. The Turkish guy behind me, when he saw the door was open, he left <laughs> to, to get a smell of it. Um, but uh, at some point they decided they wanted to restore it and they got four of four textile, four great experts in textiles um, to come to Istanbul to look at it. I think one was from Italy. I can't remember where the other countries were. Each one of them individually said that this cloak could not have been made by human hand. And I think that says a lot about it. It is extremely beautiful. And if you have a chance to visit the Herka Sharif Mosque during Ramadan, you can go and see it. It's displayed as you see it in this photograph now. They have dedicated a special room with a glass case and you can see it. And the room smells of that perfume. This is a true story, and this happened to me um, how long ago? I think in the early 70s. I was traveling through Morocco with a friend, and I was in Casablanca, and we noticed, I noticed a very distinguished gentleman wearing a golden turban, some distance from me, but he was very, as I said, distinctive. He really stood out. And the next day in Marrakesh, I traveled to Marrakesh, which is some 150 miles away. I noticed the same man. And this time he came and spoke to us. And he told us the story of a man who came to Marrakesh seeking to discover the number of, sa number of saints in the si living in the city. And this was his project. He got a small flat somewhere and uh, he went, decided to go to the local grocer to buy some sugar and tea. And as he entered the, the shop, the vendor behind the counter said, you can put me on your list. And the man was startled because he had said nothing of his project to the man. And later that day, he was at the butcher's purchasing some meat. Again, without the man speaking his project, the vendor behind the counter said to him, you can put me on your list. And at that point, the man gave up his search because he knew then that the seeker and the sort were one, not separate and that the one is the source of all things. Within every country, city and town and villages, you will find saints, some hidden, some known, and some just known by a few people. And they're in very important. The book really begins after the Prophet ﷺ with this passport photo of Sidi Mabin Habib. And this story is very interesting. In London in 1970, a young printer named John was given this passport photograph and asked to copy it. As he worked in the small dark room with its eerie red light, and the, those of you who have done developed photographs, you know what it, that experience is like. As he worked in the dark room, this hauntingly beautiful face, swathed in white, with his head wrapped in a dark turban, slowly began to appear on the white photographic paper through the developing chemicals. John was unhappy with this print. And so he decided to leave the photo in the developing tray over the weekend. But when he returned on Monday morning, the print had turned golden. 
During the following weeks, John's life took a different direction. This was a path that would reach deep into his past and his future, bringing him into the present. At that time, John was my photographic printer and close friend, and we began to talk. In 1971, after traveling to India and traveling around India for seven months, I came back to England and met a lot of old friends, some who from the 60s had got into very strange things, into more drugs. Some of them had got into black magic. And then I met some other friends who had accepted Islam. Some of them were musicians, and I kept company with them, and they told me about uh, this great sheikh who lived in Meknes. And so before Ramadan, I set off to um, Meknes to meet Sidi Mohammed Habib. When I got to the Zawiya, and to get to his room, you had to ascend a very narrow set of stairs. As I began to climb those stairs, I remember thinking that I was totally unprepared for this meeting. In India, I'd met gurus and saints and many of those kind of people, but I was not really prepared for this meeting because people talked about Sidi Mom Habib as being you know, the perfect being, insan al-kamal. And I was totally not sure what to expect. As I entered his room, and he was sitting in a four-poster bed, it's still very powerful in my mind that there was an incredible peace in that room, incredible uh, atmosphere that just was kind of overwhelming. overwhelming. He used to say the whole world is a hospital and the saints and the sages are the nurses and the doctors. In his D1 he wrote, for if a person truly knew the worth of his heart, he would give all he had without hesitation. And if a person came to know the bliss within his soul, he would shed a tear of joy with every breath he took. His seal, which you see at the bottom of the picture, it's with which he signed his letters, read, it is the will of God. There is no strength but through God. His entire character was a reflection of these two great truths. He looked at all creation with immense compassion. He was outer peace, inner peace, and peace itself. And really my true journey began at that point. And I spent uh, a month the whole of Ramadan living in his Zawiya. And it was really a cultural shock for me because it was very poor, the Zawiya. But, and he was a uh, hundred years old at that point, And he was coming down after fasting and he would, every afternoon he would give tafsir on Quran. And the whole Zawiya would fill up with these incredible people from the desert and the mountains. And I didn't speak Arabic, so I didn't really know what he was talking about. But the atmosphere in there was electric. And sometimes he would say things and people would just swoon and pass out. And he, um, three months later, he decided to go on Hajj. And when I heard he was going on Hajj, I made the intention to go on Hajj, even though I had no money. And uh, one evening, a group of people came to me and said, we have seven tickets and only six people. And they gave me a ticket. So I went on Hajj, expecting to see Sidi Mohammed Habib there. And uh, when I got to the Kaaba, uh, some of his fukara came and told us that he had died on the way to Hajj. So uh, it threw me back very much back on God and on myself. There was a man who served Sidi Mohammed uh, Habib his whole life. 
There was a man called Sidimon Bilkushi. He used to sleep outside the door of Sidimon Nabib, ready to serve him at any time. And uh, when um, Sidimon Habib died, he went and buried himself in the desert. And I went with a delegation really to confirm the belief that we understood that he had an in inherited the mantle of Sidimon Habib, and we were hoping to take instruction and guidance from him. His reply was not what we expected. He looked at us sternly and he said, I'm not a sheikh, I'm not a fakir, I'm not a deputy sheikh, he exclaimed, I'm nothing, leave me alone. His reply secretly confirmed to me of his very high station, but from humility, he did not want to make any claims about himself. The only picture that ever existed of Sidimon Mokushi was this passport photograph. And he never liked people to take his picture, not because he thought photography was forbidden, but the, he, it was, he, the, he didn't want there to be anything that made him appear that he was something. And this is a very high state of humility, especially in the kind of selfie age we find ourselves. In 2007, I returned to visit Sinimon Nam, Sinimon Bokushi. He was now 101, 102 years old and he was quite frail, but I was secretly hoping to get the long-awaited photograph of him. At a time when ego is everything, meeting someone completely free of this phenomenon is like a miracle, and I wanted to document it. After flying to Marrakesh, we made the long 11-hour drive through the Atlas Mountains to arrive at Hisawia. When I told his sons that I was hoping to photograph him, they laughed. They said, you know, he doesn't allow anybody to take his photograph. I said, thanks for that. The evening began and he came down late in the evening. And the light was terrible. There was terrible strip lighting. And I still didn't have permission to photograph him. And what I didn't want to do was upset the shirk. But um, whenever the courage took me, I took a nap. And I maybe took five pictures the whole evening. And they weren't the great pictures that I was hoping. Um, this is where he lives. So you can see the kind of place he lives. But the pictures were not the great pictures I expected. But they are him as he was. And you can see his humility and abasement that he had. Incredible uh, human being. Sidi Ali, um, I have known for a long time. And then when uh, Sidi Mohammed Nabib died, the Zawiya was looked after by uh, Sidi Ali. He was a lumberjack and uh, he was in a very bad accident and a tree fell across him and he went into a coma. And he said when he came out of the coma that Sidi Mohammed Nabib appeared to him in the coma and taught him his weird, which is recited every day, twice every day in the Zawiya. And so uh, when the Sheikh died, Sidi Mombil Kushi sent Sidi Ali to look after the Zawiya. And he's blind, but uh, he's one of these people that has a truly seeing heart. And I got to love him a lot. I used to sit with him and Whenever I would sit with him, he would say to me, eat a lot, sleep a lot, wake up shwia. And people used to laugh. We used to laugh. Sidi Ali had learned some English. But I was sitting one time years later with Sheikh Hamza. Again, Sidi Ali said, eat a lot, sleep a lot, wake up shwia. And Sheikh Hamza looked at me and said, you know, that's your medicine. He's telling you what your medicine is. Because I'm someone who doesn't sleep very much and I don't eat a lot. And I'm still working on the medicine he gave me. As the years passed, despite his continued poverty, Sidi Ali became more dignified, even stately in his demeanor. 
And I was devastated when I received the news of his passing at the beginning of 200, uh, 2017. He's left a space in my life and my trips to Morocco would not be the same without him. Um, this is uh, one of the wives of Sidi Mohammed Ibn Habib. In um, 2017, I visited uh, the Zawi in Meknes with a good friend of mine who had never had the opportunity to travel to the country. And uh, Michael Sujit and I had often talked to him about Morocco and the great people of Morocco. And he, you know, he's had a history, a really bad history of heart problems. He's nearly died a couple of times. But he said that he really wanted to go to Morocco before he passed away to meet some of these people. So he planned a trip and I was a little bit nervous, obviously, because I was concerned for his health. And he was about to go back into hospital for another operation. Anyway, we planned a small trip to Morocco. And as we approached the Zawiya, uh, Leila Zuleika was sitting in the Zawiya by the tomb, as you see her there. And as we entered the room, she looked at him and she said, I've been waiting for you. I've seen you seven times before. And she called him over and she immediately put her hand on his heart and she started to pray for him. And there were people in our group, they were crying at what was happening because it was a really powerful experience. And I remember thinking to myself, He's having the pre-op before he goes back to have the proper operation. And when the book was finished, you know, I was really keen to show him the picture and, and, and show him that I'd put the story in. And he said, but you didn't tell them that I'm getting better. I said, yeah, well, when I was doing the book, you were getting worse. And Leila Zuleika had said to him when she made the door for him, it will get worse, then you'll get better. And so now he, you know, he's getting better. And uh, may, I, may God give him a long life. This man was the uh, chauffeur of uh, Sidi Mohammed Habib. And uh, his story is amazing. With the departure of uh, Sidi Sheikh's re regular driver, Sidi Mohammed Habib asked his fukra to help him find a replacement driver. And often looking throughout Meknes, they return saying, there is one very good sheikh, sorry, excuse me, there's one very good driver, but you wouldn't want him. Why ask Sayyidina Sheikh? They said he's a degenerate sinner, they explained, a drunkard who lives in a brothel. The sheikh said, find him and bring him to me. The man who shared the sheikh's name, Muhammad, appeared sheepishly before the great saint with his eyes lowered in guilt. The sheikh offered to hire him immediately on the condition that he refrained from drinking while serving him, explaining, I don't like the smell of alcohol. The driver agreed and took the job. Sidi Muhammad began working for the sheikh, driving him to the circles of remembrance, to the mosques, to the homes of his fukara and the tombs of the saints and to the celebrations of the Prophet Muhammad's birthday. He spent every day with one of the greatest living saints of the age completely sober. Gradually, he began joining the ritual prayers and then the circles of Dhika. And finally, he turned up at the Zawiya door, asking to live there. It turned out that he had been keeping his daily prayers in the brothel and he felt he should leave. When Sidi Mamnim Habib died, his driver was devastated, like a man shipwrecked. Proximity to the Sheikh had transformed this lost soul into a man of the way. And he, he, he was a beautiful man. You can't see in the photo, but he had gold teeth as well. I went into the Zawiya one day and I saw this Fakir, Muli Abdus Salam, leaning up against a pillar, clutching his stomach, saying over and over again, Alhamdulillah, ala kulli hal. Alhamdulillah, ala kulli hal. Alhamdulillah, la kulli hal. He was obviously in extreme pain, but he kept saying, praise be to God in every state, in all states. 
And I think that's a lesson for all of us. Often we get sick and we rush to the medicine cabinet to drown some tablets when maybe we need to have patience and try and understand why we are sick. This man I met in the desert, right down in the desert in Kalamaguna, he is one of the sheikhs, uh, Mukhikams, and he had this incredible pat robe. I can't, I call it a kind of Vogue fashion version. I'm sure it's a, mo a lot posher than the, the ones the Sahaba men wear at war, but um, I think it's, uh, it's beautiful. And uh, he was a man of Tawheed. And I remember being with him, with a group of people, when there was some trivial event happened and people started to panic, the whole group. And it was really nothing. And I suddenly saw Sidi Muhammad Bashir suddenly leap in the air. And he cut through everyone's fear, exclaiming, keep calm, there's only God. You know, these people have an incredible belief in the oneness of God that it really strikes you to the core when you experience how they deal with things. This was uh, Sheikh Hamza's sheikh. Sheikh Hamza came to me one day and said, I want you to come with me to Mauritania and photograph my sheikh. And he showed me a really bad video, but I, I took one look at this very grainy video and said, I'm coming. And we, we planned a trip together and we traveled. It took us 24 hours to get there from Nogshot. And um, when I met, or when I was introduced to the Sheikh, he said to me, uh, what's your name? And they, they told him my name and uh, he went very quiet. <clears throat> and the only way I can explain this kind of transaction with him was if it was the CIA, they'd go on their mainframe computer and type your name in and check you out. But obviously he wasn't doing that. He went somewhere. And so he was quiet for a moment. And then he said, Nam, Nam. And then he made a long dua for me. And really that was really the, for me, the end of the real transla transaction with him because I don't speak Arabic. I couldn't discuss fiqh or anything with him, but it was enough for me to spend those days just watching him. And he was over 90 years of age when I went there and he only ever slept two hours every night and he only ever drank camel's milk and he spent his days when he wasn't praying just teaching his students and as a very, you know, he had incredible presence and to meet someone like that will stay with you your whole life. And I was very nervous to photograph him and uh, uh, Sheikh Hamza had not asked him and we'd already been there five days and I said, you know, we're leaving soon. And uh, I think Sheikh Hamza was nervous to ask him, but um, he, he agreed, and I think it was only because of who was asking him for the photo. And uh, when I was asking his son, I met him a couple of years ago, because we were hoping to do a, a whole issue of exemplars of our time, for our time of him. I was asking his son about other pictures of him, old passport photographs, and he said, there's nothing. You were one of the first people to ever take pictures of him. As I said, incredible presence, really. Uh, I've just included this uh, because I understand uh, some of Sheikh Mohammed's people will be watching this. And uh, so I didn't, I didn't have time to even put the title in. In the book, I called him a sign of the times. And how I met Sheikh Mohammed was, I, I, I just think it's just amazing. I was with a friend of mine in Dubai 
and we were driving along the Corniche and uh, he was telling me about Sheikh Mohammed, whom I had never met. And suddenly uh, my friend's phone uh, was FaceTime and he said, I don't believe it, it's Sheikh Mohammed calling from uh, Gambia. And so I was introduced to Sheikh Mohammed on a, on a modern mobile phone. And as I looked at his face, there was this incredible light behind his head. And I, I, said, I said to my friend, look at that. And we were just amazed. So then um, uh, I did meet him uh, sometime later. And uh, I was very drawn to him. And I, I love this photo because he's actually holding, the, actually holding the phone, probably the phone that we met on. Um, but I asked him, about whether I could do this picture of him, I kind of expected him to say no, because he's also not, you know, a very public figure. He's very quiet. But he agreed, and I said, I want to come to Gambia and, and uh, do the picture. And so we agreed, and I went to Gambia, and uh, we agreed a day that we would do the picture. But uh, so I was very busy, of course, as always, with, with people, and uh, the day was passing and I was losing the light. So I just thought I need to just kind of take control of the situation. So I went and I found a place outside his house in the garden and I stuck a chair there where the light was quite nice. And uh, I, I went in and I grabbed him and said, please bring your scarf. And he came and he sat down in front of me. And that was the picture. We did it in a few minutes. And uh, it's just beautiful. I didn't have to direct him or anything. He just was Sheikh Mohammed. And so, uh, you know, I love this photo of him. Um, and the island of Lamu, and I don't, many, I'm sure not many of you know about Lamu, but it's a small island in uh, East Africa. And uh, at the time, I, I knew about it from the early 70s. I met a Dutch painter who told me that he'd been to paradise on earth. And I said, curious, where's that? And he said, oh, the island of Lamu. And uh, he wasn't a Muslim, this painter, but he said, it's beautiful, there are no cars on the island. And uh, uh, every Friday, all the people dress in white and they go to the, you know, they go to the mosque. And uh, I discovered that they, every year they have, during the month of Maulid, they have uh, a Maulid celebration on the island. So 25 years later, I eventually went to Lamu and, uh, there was kind of, there was a bit of development. There now was one car on the island and there was one road. The car belonged to the district commissioner and the road went from his house to his office and everyone else still just used donkeys or walked. But there at the, the Maoli and I was introduced to Sheikh Rocket and um, Sheikh Rocket, his story is fascinating. He was a Catholic missionary and he had a dream in which he was told that you are a Muslim, your name is Musa Ali and you should keep company with the people who love God. And every year he attends Aulid in Lamu and every year he would go on Hajj. And people would say to him, but you don't have a passport and you don't have any money. How do you get there? And he said, by rocket. So they call him Sheikh Rocket. And he's seen in all these places. So, you know, this is the photograph. I asked him to pose for me. I didn't direct him and he just stood with his Saudi flag that he probably takes on Hajj and his Quran. He's a beautiful man, really humble. I, I have to tell this story, and I'm, I don't know how we're doing on time, but uh, I met this uh, individual when I performed the Hajj in 1971. He was a very dramatic figure. I met him at the Kaaba, and he had a head of ginger ringlets, and he was draped in a green robe, as you see in front of you, and that the, you know, with, it had bright red trimmings. And he held two things. One of them was a large, a string of large wooden prayer beads in one hand. 
and he had a beautiful crafted steel jug which was trimmed with uh, brass trimmings and he used it for you know the ritual purification in the other and um, I asked him where I could meet him in the future and he said when you come to Sudan ask for me under the date palm in Omdurman and so many years later I went to Sudan and I went to Omdurman and I kept asking people do you know Sheikh Uthman he lives under the date palm in Omdurman people looked at me as if I was crazy everyone I asked nobody knew who he was I think they thought I was nuts this kind of mad English photographer and it didn't seem as though I was going to find him but I I spent the time visiting other Shayuk and Zawiyas and I went one day to visit the Zawi of Sheikh al Saim. He was a Sheikh who fasted every day of the year except for the two Eids. And I went to his Zawiyah hoping to meet him. But when I entered the Zawiyah, they told me he was traveling. But they said, let's sit and we'll have tea together. So I was sitting in there and we were talking. And suddenly while I was talking, I heard this voice outside the door singing the Shahada at the top of his voice. And in walked Sheikh Uthman and sat right down in front of me. I couldn't believe it. There he was in front of me. He raised his hands and he started to make a very long prayer, a long supplication. He prayed for everybody, the prophets, the Sahaba, all the saints, all the sages, everybody, all the imams. It was a long, long dua. And when he finished his dua, he stood up, said, Salam Alaikum, and left. And I was so shocked and taken by it, I didn't even think to pick up my camera and take a picture of him. So I like to call this the one who escaped my camera. <laughs> okay. Beloved by name and beloved by nature. Habib Ahmed Mashur Haddad. Very important in my life, and one one I find very difficult to write about him. It is said that eighty thousand people accepted Islam from his hands, but the truth is that when it reached that figure, it told them to stop hunting. The real figure is more like one hundred twenty thousand. He was a beautiful person, really, and. Uh, again very instrumental in my journey and uh, this was him just a few weeks before he passed away and uh, he was such a compassionate beautiful soul and as i said i find it very difficult to talk about him you can only imagine what he was like I got taken to the house of uh, um, this saint in Jeddah by a woman that loves the Aulia and uh, she said, she know that I love to meet them and she said, oh, I've got somebody new for you to meet and uh, she collected that, my wife and I in her car and we went and we sat outside and she called to ask permission to come in and we waited while all the men in the house left and then we went in. And there I was introduced to uh, Habib Abdurrahman al -Atas. And he was 106 years of age and he had more energy than all of us put together. He ran around the house like a young man of 25 years old, getting us food and drinks and looking after us. And when I was with him, he said something curious to me. He said, I'm going to live till I'm 111. I never met anyone who knew when they were going to die. And some years later, I was in Jeddah. And I met a young man. And for some reason, uh, the sheikh's name came up. And he said, oh, yeah, he died recently. And I worked it backwards. Yes, he died when he was 111.
those of you that know uh, Dr. Omar Abdullah from Chicago, this was one of his sheikhs. And he took me, he took me to meet uh, Habib Ahmed Mashur Haddad. He took me to meet uh, Habib Abdul Qadir Sagar. And he said, we should visit uh, Sheikh Mohammed Abu Bakr. But he probably won't let you take his picture. He doesn't let anybody take his pictures. But we went and uh, we arrived at this very anonymous house and I greeted the Sheikh. And we had some polite exchanges before broaching the possibility of photographing him. He quickly declined, but he invited us for lunch as compensation. But during the lunch, I could tell he was mulling over my request. He said to me, what would be the purpose of the photograph? I, I explained the project that by photographing the great spiritual masters, I was hoping to present people with a true picture of Islam. And then I added, I was sure that my colleague, Dr. Amar, would love to have some pictures of his beloved teacher, as he'd never been photographed before. But still nothing was agreed, and we carried on eating. Then the Sheikh said to me, you can take my picture if I can give you something. So I said, well, I, Sheikh, I went on two accounts. He said, you can take my picture if I can give you my uh, my uh, weird or my ratib, you know, to recite. And I said, Bismillah. So we made this agreement. The Sheikh dressed up and uh, I, did, I did the pictures. And uh, you can see his presence. And uh, I sent some pictures to him just to to hope that he approved of the photographs. And I got a message back. Yes, he likes the pictures and he wants another picture done of himself, this time standing with his sword, <laughs> which I did. But I preferred these pictures actually. Uh, during the 1990s, when I was working on the Haramain project in Mecca and Medina, they discovered the house of Seda Khadija buried near the uh, piazza area. Uh, by the side of Safar and Marwa. And I was very fortunate enough to see it and photograph it. They were excavating only for three days and then they were expecting the bulldozers to come in and uh, destroy it. It's a long story which I can't go into really now, we don't have the time, but it's, it's featured in the, in the book. And I felt so honored, you know, when you see the rooms and how small they are, uh, you know, it, it, it makes the story of the Prophet Sallallahu and his wife Khadija, uh, may Allah bless them both. You know, you see really how humble the house was uh, and, obviously, and how close it was to the Haram. For many years I asked the authorities in Medina to let me climb the minaret by the side of the Green Dome, because I always was aware all the pictures of Medina showed the Green Dome as very small in the building of the mosque. And I wanted to really place it at the center of the images, but they always came up with excuses why I couldn't go up there. Uh, one of the great ones being they'd lost the keys. But I am quite persistent about these things. And every year that I was there, I would ask them. And they finally rang, ran out of excuses so they said um you can go up there but you mustn't take any pictures of the green dome and i remember thinking to myself what do they think i'm going to photograph up there the air conditioning or the the loudspeakers so i said that's fine and uh, i did it anyway um but i uh, i'm i'm pleased with this picture those of you that uh have been to Medina, where well, you know this is where you visit the Prophet and his companions. And what I didn't know in the early years was there was somebody who was allowed into this sacred chamber. And I was told about him um, by some of his people who lived not far from my house. And then one day they called me and said, he's coming to a house in High Wycombe, bring your cameras. And so I traveled to this very uh, 
small red brick house in a small town in England. And there I met uh, Sheikh Mohammed Iqbal al-Abbasi, al-Qadri al-Madini. When I met the Sheikh, he told me, for 23 years, I was the doorkeeper of the Prophet's mosque at Bab Siddiq, the door of Abu Bakr. He said, then I had the honor of cleaning inside the tomb of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, for 10 years, after which the authorities stopped this practice. And, you know, I got to know him. Now, he must have been 105 when I photographed him and I knew him for 20 years. I always visited him um, when he came to England and I met him in Dina. Um, uh, a couple of times. One day towards the end of his life, I was sitting privately with him in a room, in a room with him, he wasn't well. And I said to him, can you tell me actually what's inside the sacred space? You know, because we, we cannot see in there and they're a kind of strange idea. There's even pictures of Rumi's tomb, which they claim to be uh, the space inside. So I was just thinking with my photographic hat on what it was like in there. His answer was not what I expected. He said light. So I asked him the question again, thinking he didn't understand me. And again, his answer was light. I asked him three times. And each time he said light, and then he said, but if you don't have light, in, if you only have darkness in your heart, you will never see it. So that was his answer. I'm going to skip some of these stories now because I'm, I'm running out of a bit of time. But a lot of these stories are uh, contained within the book. Uh, and the hidden ones, we will go into more in the uh, Exemplars series. Uh, I showed this book to Habib Ali Jeffrey at some point uh, during its history of production. And uh, the first thing Habib Ali said to me is, where are the Shayuk of Syria? And I said, you know, I've never been. I don't know who they are. And he said, where's Ramadan, Sheikh Ramadan Bhuti? Where's uh, Sheikh Qudi? He listed all these people. And I said, Sheikh, I, I don't know who these people are. He said, you need to go to Syria and photograph them. And there was a kind of urgency in his voice. And then he thought and he said, no, we have to go together because they, they won't let you take their pictures. I'll have to intercede for you. And uh, true to his word, we traveled to Syria together and he introduced me to all these people. And this was before the war. I'm so lucky that we did it because, you know, things changed so rapidly after this. When we were on our way to meet uh, Sheikh Abu Hassan, Muhyiddin Ibn Hassan, Ibn Mahriya Qudi, in the car, Habib Ali kept saying to me, he looks like the Sahaba. And I remember thinking, how does Habib Ali know what the Sahaba look like? And he said to me, he doesn't like to be photographed. And I said, oh dear, thank you for that. And we entered the room of the sheikh. And as I saw him, I got goosebumps because he just had an incredible light and incredible presence. And uh, I, in my heart, I was thinking, I really want to photograph him. So Habib Ali started talking to him and explained that who I was and I was a photographer and everything. And the sheikh cut through the conversation and said, don't ask meaning don't ask just do it if you ask i have to say no and so i did i did it quickly before he changed his mind and i'm so glad i got these pictures of him he is such a beautiful soul really in turkmenistan i did a long journey by car from istanbul driving along the silk route through turkey through iran into Turkmenistan. We didn't intend to go to Uzbekistan, but the border was closed, so we ended up in, a, in the city of Merv, the ancient city of Merv. And there are two Sahaba buried there, how they ended up in this remote place, 3,000 miles from, uh, sorry, 3,000 kilometers from Mindina. 
I have no idea. But when we uh, when we arrived at the tomb, I noticed this woman there, all in green, green who was being uh, waiting for a young man to open the tomb. And so we entered with this woman, and I was looking at her, at her at the corner of my eye, and I knew that she was a very saintly person. But I, you know, I really wanted to photograph her, but I didn't feel it was correct. I, I didn't know what the culture was about photographing women, so I was very patient. We got talking to her, and she told me that like, through um, somebody who was with her, they told me that she served the, for 60 years a nearby tomb of a Qadri Sheikh called Yusuf al Hamdani. And I was sitting there, and the light was disappearing, and I was thinking, oh, I really want to photograph this woman. And her friend said, take her picture, because you see I had cameras in my hand. And I said, well, you ask her. And the woman humbly agreed and I took these pictures not expecting they would come out because the light was very low but uh, they did alhamdulillah and uh, it was an amazing honor to meet this woman and she told me a lot of amazing things again this story you'll need to read in the, in the book it's a it's a lovely story though I, I've been, uh, been going to China since night, uh, the year 2000, and uh, these are some of the shayuk I met there. This man, he rode a bicycle every day, and he was 90, over 90 years of age. Sidi Abu Bakr Martin Nings, probably those of you who know who've seen the, uh, the, book of, the Book of Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in English. Um, I'll just tell this story to conclude the presentation. The book was kind of finished, and uh, I said, that's it. And I went to uh, Manchester to give a presentation about this project. And I went through the whole book. And at the end of it, this lady came up to me, so full of light. And I felt like she's really at home with these people. They're like her family. And uh, as she started to tell me a story. And I said, look, I need to come to your house and photograph you. and." document the story and which I did and her story is really incredible and uh, briefly she was at university she wasn't a Muslim and she fell in love with a Pakistani man and he asked her to marry her and she said I'll marry you but I'm not changing my religion and he said, that's fine. They got married and he died very young. And she told me that as a child, often she would get sick. And when she got sick, she would retire to her bed. And she would be laying in her bed and her deceased grandmother would appear in front of her, full of light. And she knew that everything was that she was safe and nothing would harm her and she would recover. And this happened several times in her life. When her husband died, she decided to make, she wanted to make Hajj. And she was preparing for the Hajj and she got sick. And as usual, she retired to her bed. But this time, instead of her grandmother appearing, this gentleman, illuminated soul appeared in her room and she just knew everything was safe. She was safe. Everything would be fine. She recovered and a couple of days later she went to a bookshop. She went to the bookshop and she saw a book on the bookshelf and she said to the man who owned the bookshelf, who's this man? The book had a picture on the man. Who is this man? He was in my room the other night. And the man said, that's Habib Ahmed Mashul al-Haddad. And she said, he said to her, if you're going on Hajj, you should go and visit him. So she did her Hajj, and when she was in Mecca, she always loved the word Mashallah, and she bought a necklace with the word Mashallah on, on, on it in Arabic, and she tucked it inside her dress. When she went to Jeddah and she visited Habib Ahmed Mashur, her dad's house. As she entered the house, Habib came towards her and he said, MashaAllah. 
And he, during the meeting, he gave her a set of prayer beads and he said, don't let it go hungry. And now in her very elderly years, she buys sets of beads from you know charity shops and she makes them into prayer beads and gives them to people. And she's really a, you know, she's really a beautiful soul. And uh, I felt it was very important that I met her at that time. From the mountains view, there's a, a line in the D1 of Sinimam Nabi which says, then let your thoughts range free before the mountains and you will find them without doubt to be the pegs of the earth. They are among us, though we may not see them. Thank you for your patience. MashaAllah, MashaAllah, JazakAllah khair. Thank you, CD. Truly as moving as the first time that I saw it. And uh, even though partially I just want to be quiet after seeing that, um, <laughs> I will engage in questions, inshallah. Um, you know, this book is about the saints and sages of Islam. And <coughs> I think it's fair to say that when people think about Islam, most people in our English speaking world, the first thing they don't think of is saints and sages. Yeah. And I'm curious for you, um, because also you talked a little bit about your journey and being a seeker in the, in the 60s and early 70s and going to India. You know, what is it that you were seeking? And what is it that you found that these people had? Yeah. I think at some point towards the end of the 60s, I wasn't having a crisis, but I got to a point thinking about that. I realized I was quite anxious as a person and it bothered me. I never felt comfortable feeling anxious. And it wasn't often about anything specific. I just felt anxious. And I really wanted to find an answer to that. And I remember um, reading uh, a book by somebody who's an oh dear, whose name escapes me. He's a very popular read uh, writer. But um, from that book, I then read um, Autobiography of a Yogi, which is a book about a guru, a yogi called uh, Yogananda. And I've since discovered that this was Steve Jobs' favorite book. And in fact, it was distributed at his uh, funeral. And um, which was very interesting. And it had a big effect on me, that book, because Yogananda was a very interesting person. He grew up in the world of saints and masters, and uh, he met his own master at the Kumbhla Mela. And he, as he got older, he traveled to the West, and he was one of the early people that brought meditation to the Western world in the, in the early 50s. And, you know, I read the book and it made a lot of sense to me. And I think now, unknowingly, that book planted a seed in my heart. So then uh, after being in India and making my own journey of looking for a teacher, I think when I came back to England and was kind of introduced to Islam in a bigger way, I just kind of, kind of fell into that kind of quest to meet these people because I knew those people held the answers to what I was looking for. And I didn't really know what it was, but I knew that it's some, you just recognize it when you meet those people. You know, we're talking about something that's beyond words. This is to do with the the, ruh, the spirit. And uh, so often words are a bit clumsy to kind of describe all this, but it's all I know it's about light. And I was thinking about Meetings with Mountains. Meetings with Mountains is about inward light, and it was a project using outward light to try and <laughs> explore that subject. 
Mashallah. If that makes sense. Absolutely. And I think, you know, the the metaphor of the mountain is apt too, because I think for a lot of people um, in our modern world, when they think about religion, they think about the rituals, they think about the the various acts, the commands and the prohibitions. Yeah. But they don't necessarily see that this is, uh, that it's a journey to a realization that it's supposed to lead you yeah. somewhere. And yeah. like you mentioned, you know, I remember personally reading my first exposure to Islam was through some of the great saints, their writings, right? Rumi, Ibn Arabi, and things like this. And for me, it let me know that, oh, this leads somewhere, that they're experiencing something, they've realized something, they've awakened into a reality, and that's what I want, that's what I seek. And like you mentioned, if you read the great works of the saints and ages across human history, they're very unanimous, right? It's not just um, a, a type of realization, but it's actually an experience of beauty, right? It's not just a knowledge that they discovered a secret, but they actually came to experience the fullness of what it means to be human. And I'm just curious, you know, and I know Sidi Harun, Michael Sujik, uh, you know, he, he wrote a work also documenting the saints that he interacted with and our beloved, you know, Daniel Abdahai Moore, also in poetry. I feel like in a certain sense, all of you through your, through writing prose or poetry or through photography, it's been a desire to convey or transmit what you all received from the presence of these individuals. So I just, yeah. I wonder if you might speak a little bit about that dimension of Islam, that inner transformative um, dimension and how even Muslims, we don't necessarily always uh, emphasize that dimension in our time. Yeah. I have to, you know, I have to admit that when I started off on my journey, I, I wasn't looking for a religion as such. I was really looking for a spiritual path. And um, when I got to that point, when really I discovered that Islam had a whole spiritual dimension to it, and I went to ask somebody, you know, can you explain to me the practice of Tasawwuf. And I even hate using these terms because immediately people, if you use Sufism or Tasawwuf, people put you in a box. I'm uncomfortable using I like to use the word spirituality. But it is, by all means, encased within Tasawwuf. And I asked this man about it and he explained to me. But he said, if you just take Tasawwuf by itself, it's very dangerous. He said it's like plugging into the mains without any insulation on it. You could get destroyed. And it's to protect you. The whole of Islam, the wudu, the prayers, the fasting, everything is to ground you in your body. That's preparing the building. And then the spiritual practices are what lift you out of the body. But you need to be grounded, otherwise it's dangerous. Someone said if you were trying to get to, you know, when they plan these moon missions or whatever they're doing planning to go to the mark all the there's so much time because there were all the planning and the instructions they won't need to get to the target they don't want to miss the target so the you know the grounding is very important and that made sense to me i okay, said okay i'm ready that's what i want you know so that's how my understanding of it is um as i said i wasn't looking for a religion because religion has become a very weighty word these days. And people have had bad experiences from religions, not just, you know. But the thing about the, thing about, um, the saints and sages is you find saints and sages within every religion. And that's where we meet. I mean, I was so honored with the book because I wanted someone to write something, somebody that was respected. And to be honest, I sent this to a few notable Muslims and the reply came back, I'm too busy. The one person replied was the His Holiness the Dalai Lama. And when that letter came, 
I was so, my wife and I, we were like touched that he took the time to read the book and then wrote the letter, you know, and that really was, it's not that we need other people to endorse it, but he could see the, the spirituality in these people's faces. And there was a kind of understanding, you know, in human beings. And that's, I find that it's at that level that we can meet with anybody, you know. If we talk about religions, these things tend to divide us. They shouldn't do, but they tend to. But if you're talking about spirituality and like you connect with a much, a very large group of people. And I feel that, especially after the pandemic, we need to link, we need to link with like-minded people. Look what's happening in the world. It can go on the way it's going on. Something has to change. Mashallah. Absolutely. And, you know, mashallah, what I really like also about this book is you're not just telling the biographies of these individuals. There is that biographical dimension, but you're also sharing your personal experience and your personal story of how this photograph came about. And um, I'm curious, sitting with all these people, and, and we're really talking about people separated by vast expanses all over the earth, people uh, of different uh, continents, of different backgrounds, but all united by the same tradition, the same spiritual tradition. I'm curious if you could, you know, I know we could probably speak about this till the end of time, but if you could boil down a few key elements of what you felt that these people had qualities that the saintly ones have, that those of us striving to be like them may not embody as well. But what, what were those qualities that you felt in their presence or that they exhibited or they exuded when you were with them? Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important question because people um, understandably are a little bit nervous to sit in the front of these people because they see you. I mean, they see you, they know everything about you. But somebody wiser than me told me that when you sit in front of these people, there is no judgment, zero judgment. They do not look at you and say, this, they see this thing and then you don't do that, you don't do that. Well, how they see you is they see you at a certain point in your spiritual journey. So they know where you are in your journey. And then they make doers for you. If you ask them advice, they'll give you advice that is valuable. It's like a doctor. The doctor looks at your body. They look at your spirit. And they know what you need to be a, a better person. You know, I told you the thing that Sidi Ali said to me. He said to me, eat a lot and sleep a lot. Now, for some people, the shaykh would say to him, you need to fast. You need to sleep less. But it depends on your character, you see. There are great stories about Aulia that spend their life not sleeping and fighting sleep and then towards the end of their life they give up it and they just sleep and then they have their opening, they have their fatiha. <laughs> it's not always the way that you think it's going to be. <laughs> so these people know what your medicine is and that's why you go to them. And the important thing is, as well as zero judgment, is that they're not drawing you to them they're like a signpost they're saying it's not me it's god it's god and its prophet that's who you need to go to i'm just a person on the way who can maybe help you possibly there's always so much humility with them really they are the most humble they never think that they're anybody like sidi mandel kushi said to me i'm nothing i'm not a mukadam i'm not a sheikh i'm nothing leave me alone they do not want it really and you wouldn't want it you know what fame does to pop star, you know film stars and pop stars it's it's a it's not a thing to seek after and if you're have inklings for it it's 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 it's, it's very dangerous you're on the path Marshall. so you learn that from them. and it seems also that you know, from what you described, one of the key qualities that all of these people in their own way, and it may be different, but that they're per perpetually um, in service and seeing their mission as really being in service 
of humanity and almost like, you know, they are the guides. If they've been up the mountain, they're coming back and yeah. trying to help those of us who are struggling step by step and following on the way. And they're, they're really just the guides on the path. Is that what you yeah. expect? Yeah, exactly. That's it. Exactly. And uh, you can't, you can't climb, Mer you can't climb Mount Everest without a guide. <laughs> An interesting Mustafa Salama, who I met, he wrote um, a brief thing for the book, and I met him. He's a really interesting character. He um, had a dream one night that he was standing on the highest summit and uh, calling the Adhan. And he phoned his friend up the next morning. He said, what's the highest summit? And his friend said, it's Mount Everest. He'd never climbed a mountain in his life. He learned to climb. He climbed Mount Everest. He's done the Grand Slam now, the highest, the seven highest summits. He's been to the South Pole and the North Pole. And everywhere he's gone, he's prayed and, and uh, called the Adhan there. And I asked him, what's it like? He said, when you get to the top of Everest, you feel like you're with the prophets. You feel like you're with the saints and the sages. <laughs> Mashallah, that's beautiful. So many of these people, they're part of great traditions. I mean, you, you talk about Habib Mashur al-Haddad. I think about the Habib yeah. as like this old growth forest of these, this spiritual lineage. You talk about Sheikh Mohammed al-Habib. I know he comes out of this, this great lineage and all of them do. And uh, I wonder, you know, we there's a lot of talk about ecology and, um, you know, um, species and plants and animals that are going extinct. But yeah. someone recently, an anthropologist that I was listening to mentioned that languages are going extinct faster than plants and animals. And he said, a language is an old growth forest of the mind, right? It's, it's this whole living tradition. And I think about what it takes to produce saints in, in the normal sense, right? There could be saints in any time and place. But I'm just curious because you, in a certain sense, got a, a peek into some of these traditions that were a thousand years old and more, but that have um, become endangered because of the modern world and, and great transformations that have happened in the, in the um, succeeding decades over the past few decades. So I, I wonder if you, you might speak a little bit about that and, and these traditions and the, the preciousness of them and the kind of endangered nature of, of, of the way of life that they lived. Yeah, it's interesting you talked about languages because there are various people in this book that I met where I, we didn't speak a common language. And I spent days with them. We had an understanding. I mean, it was like our hearts were connected. We didn't need a language, actually. It was just, we just, we understood one another. And, uh, it, it, you know, seeing, sitting, at that time when I met him, it must have been what it was like at the time of Sheikh Abdul Qadir Jilani or Sheikh Shazili. I mean, you know, this, this incredible atmosphere, this love and devotion between them and their followers. And I really felt like I was going back in time. Again, with Sheikh Marabu Al Hajj, you know, it just... It's why I was so determined to photograph him because I felt that when he disappeared and I called where he lived a university without walls, that when someone like that disappears, there's going to be a gap. And I definitely feel that by the grace of God, you know, I was able to witness maybe the end of traditional Islam as we understand it. And we're into a very different ball game. But then I met Sheikh, Sheikh Muhammad. And Sheikh Mohammed is a different kind of being. I mean, he's from the Jalani, the Qadir Jalani family. I mean, he's from that family. But he, you know, the fact they met him on a 20th century phone was just like, he's definitely for our time. He doesn't talk a lot. He's like a doctor. When you visit him, it's like going to a doctor's surgery. You're in the waiting room and waiting to have a brief visit with him. And, uh, yeah, he's definitely really 
as I, it's why I called him a sign of the times. Really, I really feel that about him. And I think there are more, we more Shayu Kanaule are coming up like that. Um, we're living in strange times, you know. I love the, the line of poetry that you mentioned from Sheikh uh, Muhammad ibn al-Habib. If a person came to know the bliss within his own soul, he would shed a tear of joy with every breath he took. Yeah. And that is what you find with these individuals is like this perfect peace. Um, that they have come to see that in truth and in the end, all is well. And that doesn't mean yeah. that they are uh, passively letting the world happen without engaging. You know, many of these great saints, as we know of history, they actually were warriors and they were engaged yeah. even in the political realm and they were serving and they were running great orphanages or great schools or universities. So it's not about totally stepping away from the world, but there's a quality of complete trust and complete peace in that yeah. engagement and that's also kind of what you're saying because i think I, we can even find a sense of sadness or loss of what you mentioned that tradition traditional islam the traditional worldview that is that is often kind of confronted um very aggressively by a modern a very different you know civilization but i think what you say is really beautiful is is in taking from these great saints and sages that complete trust like as yes. Sheikh Abdul Murad says, that history is in good hands. This is Allah's affair. And Absolutely. all we have to do is just try to align ourselves with truth and with beauty and with virtue and with that prophetic way and leave the rest to Allah. Uh, an example of uh, this adaption to modernity you know, and as I mentioned, Sheikh Mohammed comes from a very traditional, you know, upbringing. But someone asked him a question: How, how do you, uh, how do you recognize like a true teacher? And he said, uh, he said, um, you can have the best phone in the world, but if you don't have a SIM card in it. You're not connected, mm. and I love, I love that. That's, I can understand that mm. <laughs> much easier than if he talked to me for half an hour. And uh, I think the modern generation, the younger generation, that's how they think. That's why I think images have become the language of our time. We live in a very fast world. I mean, alhamdulillah, thank God it's been slowed down by the pandemic because we were really traveling at an incredible speed, but we do live in a very fast world. And uh, so the young people need simple answers. They need clear answers. And I think the people that can give those answers will appear. It's a, it's a nature of God that mm. what you need will be, will be there. Beautiful. Actually, that kind of anticipates question I was going to ask is if someone is out there listening or watching and is thinking, I want to meet these people. I want to be amongst these people. Uh, how can I find them? What, what would your, would you give any advice? What would your advice be? <laughs> you know, there's a line in uh, Simon Habib's Diwan. Uh, if you really want to see these people, if you really desire, you will see them without traveling. That's the first thing. But first of all, you have to make the intention and then you have to ask God. One of God's names is Al-Hadi, he's the guide. So if you ask him, he will guide you to them. And then, but the very important thing is be very, how can I say this? It's very easy to miss these people as they are so hidden. So when you're in the company, just watch your heart a little bit because you can miss them very, very easily. You might notice someone that's got a lot of charisma and is dressed very well. 
but the person you should be talking to is very hidden, sitting quietly in a corner. And, and, and then when you do meet them, listen carefully to what they say to you. If you think about the meeting, I often think about this, the meeting between Rumi and Shamsi Tabriz. And you, you know, you can read that meeting. What state was Rumi in for Shamsi Tabriz to say those couple of things to him that ignited his heart? You know, and that's really, we need to get towards that state really, where we are really open and with humility and just watching. And I'm fortunate because photography teaches you to watch. You have to be very patient and watch, otherwise you miss everything. <laughs> so I've been trained uh, in my uh, work to uh, learn that. And you have to learn it. It's very, you know, we have what they call monkey brain. You know, we all have monkey brain. It's jumping around all over the place. And uh, you have to just sit still, watch your breathing, as everyone tells you to do these days, calm yourself down, then you'll see amazing things. But if you're running around like headless chickens, you'll miss everything. <laughs> that's life, really, isn't it? <laughs> no, that's true. And that is the quality of St. Lawrence is that they we are, you know, only when the sand has settled can you see the waters through. Right, so much of us is kicking up the, the dust and the salt, right? But that when you have that complete tranquility, it's there's a transparency almost like they're they're an open door into another world, you know, and you're catching the breezes that are wafting through. And I really like what you said about preparedness. And and so much of our tradition is really about like prepare the cup for what is poured or, or polish the mirror so the light can be reflected. The light is always there. The question is our preparedness exactly. to reflect. So exactly. I think that's yeah. really beautiful. And there is a stillness and, and a um, interiority in these people that is difficult, is made more difficult by our time because everything is pushing us more external and everything is sped up, as you mentioned. And so, yeah, I mean, I pray that we can start to cultivate that. And yet, like you said, use this strange and difficult time to, to be forced in. I think a lot of us are really forced in. I mean, so maybe um, as we close, I wanted to, to just, one, I want to ask um, about the projects you're working on now. But before that, if you had any advice or, or <laughs> how, let me put it this way, how do you think some of these great saints and sages would respond to a question like, how should we approach this time of being isolated and locked down and the world is in this great anxiety and we're all, we're all being confronted with our mortality, whether it's exactly. our own sickness, the sickness of those around us. What do you think they might say as by way of advice for us in this time? I think, um, I know some of them said it's a, it's a really uh, great time to study and a good time to study. Um, and I think that's important. I think those of us who are not very academic and more on the creative side, it's a great time to be creative and learn your art and learn yourself about yourself in the process. Shakhamza told me that there was a philosopher, I think from the 12th century, and he said that whatever you do in life, if you're a doctor or a carpenter, or whatever it is, whatever you do, if you do it to the best of your ability, with the greatest of excellence, you will learn everything you need to know about yourself. As I said, you know, immediately I sit down to take pictures. I'm going to have all these thoughts trying to distract me. And I have to learn to calm that process down and still myself. So, you know, you learn these tools even by doing art forms. I think my own experience, and I, I did a couple of um, retreats in my life with uh, supervision. And I remember the first time I went into a kind of uh, retreat mode, I was in this room by myself and I was kind of, the first couple of days I was just kind of pacing myself. 
walking around and uh, I felt a bit like a caged tiger. And then I think after the third day, you accept your fate and uh, you sit quietly. And then by the fourth day, you're thinking, actually, this room is really quite large. And look, the sun is shining and uh, you begin to enjoy the space. It becomes, when you were pacing about, it's very small. But uh, once you accept it, okay, I'm going to affect the confines of this situation. And what can I do with these confinements? Uh, it forces you into a different direction. And I think that's very important to learn. Rather than struggling it or battling with it, okay, this is the situation. I mean, what's the best I can make out of it? And I think that's really my own uh, advice. Uh, and and it's, uh, once you've done it a few times, it's easy. So when, when you're, even when you're traveling and things happen, you accept them much easily because you just see it's, it's kind of something out of your control. Uh, obviously, if you can change the situation, you will, but if it's obvious it's out of your control, you submit to it. Submit to Sa Salma and then uh, you see what's in store for you. I think that's the best advice I can give for it. I know it's hard for young people. Young people like to be out doing things and I'm, you know, from an older generation. I'm kind of enjoying it, but I know it's tough. But uh, just try and benefit from some. It's like Ramadan. Ramadan's difficult at the beginning, and towards the end of it, you don't want it to finish. <laughs> I think it'll be like this when the pandemic's over. I've... Mashallah. So um, I'd be very happy to keep you up all night talking about these great saints and sages of Islam, mm -hmm. but uh, we want to honor that it is an evening there. And um, mashallah, you've been very generous with your time. So I guess in closing, I'd love to hear about uh, what you're working on now. I know this was a 50 year project. So what are the next uh, 50 <laughs> years looking like for you? <laughs> what are you working on now? Um, yeah, it's embarrassing that meetings of mountains took so long. Um, but getting the text was really right for me. As you said, it's, it wasn't a biography about these people. It really was about the meetings and what happened when I met them and what happened when I, how I got to take their pictures and everything. Um, so during the pandemic, I, I've been going to China quite regularly since um, the year two, 2000. And I've done four trips and I always wanted to do a book about Muslims in China. And uh, I mean, I haven't been there during the, the period that, you know, um, unfortunately, this is what's happening in West China. Um, but I did travel into that area before all, all this happened. And uh, I've, always, I've always wanted to go to China from the late 60s, from when I knew there were Muslims there, because there was something about them that I was really drawn to. The fact, and what it is, is the fact that they are Chinese, but they're also Muslim. They're not Chinese that became Arabs. They are Muslims who became who are Chinese. And so they've kept their culture. And I love this kind of fusion of the two, the two things. And and so, you know, I've been wanting to do this book and the lockdown just said, well, now's your opportunity. You've been traveling all the time and avoiding getting on with it. So I kind of put the book together in about six weeks. And uh, laid it all out it's got loads of Hajnuddin's calligraphy in it and uh, it's really nice and and what I wanted to do in the book was explore this synergy between uh, really like the spiritual side of Islam as well as uh, the, the religion of Islam but with Confucianism and Taoism uh, and so the book is called uh, Heaven, Earth, and the Ten Thousand Things, and I kept um, uh, asking why, why, because they were there sixty years after Hij after Hijra, as far as we can understand. And I mean, how did they get to China? I mean, there were no planes or anything, so they went by ship and they went overland. And as far as we understand, there are a few Sahaba buried there. I think they're actually sons of Sahaba. It's kind of 
there's a lot of different stories about who's buried there, but there are, I've been to the tombs and there, whoever they are, they're quite extraordinary people. And I explored the whole history there. And I kept asking myself, how were they, how did this synergy happen? And the only way I can explain it is that the Arabs that went there were very sophisticated at that time. You know, it was quite close after the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Chinese at that time, as I said, were Confucian and Taoist monks. That was the religion of the time. And so there was this incredible synergy because when the Muslims talked about the way, the Chinese knew what they were talking about. And those early Arabs didn't go there to impose a culture on them. They just went to, to share with them and find some kind of understanding. And I think that's why the thing happened like it did. And really that's what I'm exploring in the book. And when you look at these people's faces, and I travel, as I said, I've traveled right across China from east to west and from north to south. We went from Beijing to Kashgar, and I went to Inner Mongolia and right down to um, Guangzhou and all these places, you know. And uh, uh, Sakita Morata, you know, uh, the, the, the lady that wrote, she's written the forward to it. So I'm really honored, you know, that she agreed to write that. So I'm, you know, I'm working every week with my editor just to get the tech. I really want to get the text right because I can't really talk about what's happening in China because I don't have first-hand experience and I don't think it helps. I mean, we, we can see it in there. But really, I just want to show these are normal Muslims. They're just beautiful people who are very Chinese, really. They're very Chinese. If you go and see their mosques, I described it in an interview I did as being um, like looking like Confucian temples with Feng Shi gardens, you know, <laughs> it's just it's just this incredible fusion, you know, and they are so beautiful, really. So that's one thing, and then we're doing exemplars. We're doing exemplars for our time, which is a con it's a kind of continuation of mountains, but as I said, exploring some of the individual mountains in more depth, telling their stories with more pictures and things. And then I've been discovering, as I mentioned earlier to you, I discovered all my old pictures from Hajj um, from 1971. And uh, I've been able to re-edit them and re-see them. And it's it's just amazing to take myself back 50 years to that Hajj I did and seeing Mecca when it was just, you know, when the Haram was just a two-story building, you know, with the old Bilal's mosque, mosque on the hill and incredible. I'm lucky to have seen it at that time. Absolutely. And we're lucky to be able to see all these things through your eyes and that you've preserved it for us. And, you know, I can very much say on a personal note, like you yourself and your generation, um, you know, Sidi Abdul Haimur, Sidi Harun, Hakim Archuleta, Dr. Omar, we could go on and on about um, your generation that really, uh, is very much a bridge for, for my generation and those that come after us in that you were Westerners and you were seekers and artists and you were um, seeking truth. And in the midst of this great turning East for spiritual depth that was happening in those sixties and seventies counterculture, political engagement, music, arts, you know, rock and roll and psychedelics and the whole affair, you know, yeah. Um, the fact that you all connected to this living tradition and you connected to the great representatives of this, you know, 1400 year tradition back to the beloved Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know, you guys really laid the groundwork for, for myself and, and, and others that are seekers from our generation who were able to see the beauty of Islam more fully because of the fact that you had translated the books and the poems and that you had shared the the photographs and the, the videos, you know, there was so much more for us coming of age in the 90s than there was for you all coming of age in the in the 60s and 70s. Right. So uh, I just, you know, feel a sense of deep gratitude for you and for all of our dear, beloved elder brothers and sisters on the path. And um you know, this is really sacred work because 
we're not just trying to preserve the old stories, but we're trying to seek what they sought, as you as you yeah. mentioned. And they and are inviting us into this reality and into the presence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yeah, and it's the grace of God that we were able to do this, you know, that I was where I got the energy to travel around the world and meet these people I never know. It's, it's the grace of Allah, you know, and um, I'm so grateful that I was did it and I was chosen to, you know, I don't know why it was me, but I'm, I'm ever grateful for God that I did it. I, I wanted to add one thing that um, during this pandemic and um, while Sidi Harun and I are working on exemplars, I wanted to kind of create a bridge between meetings and exemplars and so i was thinking what could i do and there was a lot you know meetings and mountains became huge it's already big i mean it's nearly a 400 page book and there was a lot of people i had to leave out and stories and stuff and so i thought oh, i can use instagram to kind of tell some of these stories and show pictures of the people that got left out so we're i'm kind of doing that it's very hard i find doing social media very hard um, because I'm busy, but um, I have a friend who's cracking the whip and saying, okay, every five days you have to do a post. So we just started the last week. And uh, so people that, you know, are into Instagram, if you just go onto, onto my thing, you, hopefully you'll see some interesting things uh, in the next coming month. So uh, it's all the things, it's like, what do they call the outtakes or something? <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to encourage everyone to, to visit your website and to follow you on social media. And I also wanted to ask, is there a place that people can purchase your book um, yeah. online? Yeah, there's it, it's a couple of places. It's on my website. If you go to my website or you type in Peter Sanders, um, mm. dot, I think, I don't know, it's, it's forward slash MWW. Anyway, as soon as you go to my holding page, scroll down there's a banner that says meetings and mountains you can buy it in the states mecca books has uh, i just shipped them another la uh, large bunch of them because we did a we've reprinted it um the first edition sold out within six months which i was it was just amazing really and uh, i reprinted it and last year and then I, I haven't been able to go on tour we were supposed to tour in the states this year but i mean sorry last year but inshallah, when this finishes, we'll tour again. So uh, Mecca Books has loads of copies of it. And I think I think it's on Amazon, but it's more expensive on Amazon. So uh, it's uh, those are the two main places. I tried to keep the price down. It was a very expensive book to produce. And, uh, you know, but I wanted people to have access to it. So we, we kept the price down, which is partly why we haven't given it to all the big distributors and stuff. Just uh, make a book. So there you go. Right there. Alhamdulillah. Well, we'll link to that and make sure people um, have access to that. And it's such a beautiful project to support. And uh, again, I want to just thank you for your time, mashallah. And uh, we look forward to hosting you in the States when when the world opens up again, inshallah. Yeah, I would love that. I would love that. I'm looking forward. I had such a great time when we did the first book tour. Um, meeting everybody so i look forward to doing it again inshallah. thank you for inviting me i really enjoyed it. thank you assalamu alaikum